Okay, right. Good afternoon, evening. I think we may even have some good mornings, possibly. Um, and uh, welcome to uh, this session of the Amnesty Research Summit. Um, we have got a really fantastic panel um, of um, people lined up for you um, to talk about storytelling with historical resources. So I'm Jessica, I'm from the Summit Squad, and I'm filling in today as facilitator, as unfortunately, Eugène Delacroissant couldn't be here. Um, but hopefully um, that's um, OK and we'll, um, we'll be absolutely fine. I'm afraid I won't be as entertaining as it would have been to have you, Jane, here. Um, so just to introduce our panel to you today. Um, firstly, we've got Sarah Rose, who's a library assistant based in local studies and information at Halifax Central Library. Her main role is to assist people to access and use library resources, but she's particularly interested in helping to highlight the stories of marginalised communities and making local history as accessible as possible to a wider audience. We've got Ruth, who's joined us from um, Cultural Office of the West Yorkshire Archive Service. Um, Ruth is an archivist there. And her role is to care for and manage access to the Calderdale Archive collections and to highlight stories from those collections through events, both um, events and activities, both in person and also online. Um, Angela Clare works for Calderdale Museum Service. Um, that looks after Amnesty's home of Shibden Hall, as I'm sure many of you have been to visit. Angela's role has um, seen her sharing Anne's story through a series of talks, tours, films, exhibitions, online content and printed guidebooks. She's also written her own fictional account of Anne's life, The Moss House, as Clara Barley. Jill Carpenter has joined us from Coldsdale Libraries. Um, Jill is an information assistant. And for the last three years, she's been involved in creating and promoting cultural content that can be accessed online. She produces and presents Coldsdale Libraries' local history podcast, History Out Loud, which has been up and running since 2021 and available on all good platforms where you find your podcasts. So a huge welcome to our panellists. Um, we're really um, grateful for, for you joining us and we're going to dive in with some questions, um, if that's OK. Um, so what we'll do is we will also take some questions in the chat. So if you do have anything that sparks um, your imagination, pop it in the chat and we will collate those and have some Q&A at the end. But before we do that, let's dive straight in with some questions for the panel. So I'm really interested to know whether... Have, have there been any stories at work um, in your respective roles that have really made you think this is definitely a tale that should be told? Um, so let's get started with Ruth on that one. Um, there's, I mean, the answer is yes. So many of um, our, the items in our collections tell these amazing stories. And sometimes you'll look at it and you'll be like, this story is amazing. People need to, people need to know about this. And other times you'll just be like, this has made me laugh. And I really want people <laughs> to know about this. So I think for the last one I can remember is my colleague Steve was looking for something entirely, entirely different and unconnected um, and accidentally came across some... Um, goat registration cards in the Rawson collection um, where you register your goats to be in the British Goat Society's herd book and they were these adorable little cards and you had like the names of the goats and everything um, and that went down a massive spiral rabbit hole um, that ended up I was looking at um, John Selwyn Rawson was the owner of the goats and one of his goats was called Fenella and we also noticed his granddaughter was called Anne Fenella, and uh, we became obsessed with the idea that she was named after the family's favourite goat, which we cannot prove, uh, but we also cannot disprove. So lots and lots of our stories end up um, just sticking in our heads like that. And we're like, oh, people need to know this because it's made us laugh or it's made us smile. Or sometimes if, you know, they're quite emotional and they make you cry. Um, the human stories and the little idiosyncrasies about being human are definitely always things that we want to share. Yeah, absolutely. Really emotive, as you say. The goat one sounds hilarious, but also very on brand for Anlista, which is uh, it's a, a really great one to to recall. Um, how about you, Sarah? Is there anything that you've come across in local studies? Yeah, I mean, like Ruth, we come across things all the time and we're like, oh, wow, this is great. I've never heard of this person. We need to tell this story. Uh, but the main thing that I've come across recently that I'm looking into is um, the black abolitionists that came and spoke in Halifax and around Calderdale, because there's like loads, we know about Frederick Douglass, but there's loads of others that came and spoke in like Brick House and Halifax and things. So I've been helping a couple of 
local history researchers that are probably going to take it forward to sort of find the resources that we can and see what we how we can help them to tell that story. Fabulous. Excellent. Well, we'll look forward to that one for sure. Um, how about um, you, Jill? A slightly different question. When researching a particular topic um, in, in your role, do you look for something in particular or do you kind of just browse through material and wait to be surprised? Um, well, the, the nature of the work is, as, as Ruth hinted, um, it, you, you're constantly surrounded by potential stories. They're just, you know, that is basically all we really deal with. And um, so it you don't really have to go hunting. Um, it I like to think it, it's more like fishing, really, rather than hunting, in that you kind of, you just cast your line and then you carry on doing your work and then and then you'll get a tug on the line and um and then suddenly your curiosity is is really triggered and you you know you you think to yourself oh i really you know that's really interesting i wonder if other people would be interested in it and you kind of take it from there and yeah um, yeah but it, it's you, you kind of always worry a little bit well i do with the podcast that um one day am i going to run out of stories but i haven't yet so <laughs> Keep doing it. <laughs> I think you take requests too don't you um for, for the podcast yeah. if anybody's got any yeah. stories that they've come across yep yeah yep. and I and love guests. that fishing analogy we need guests as well we need guests <laughs> yeah. there, there's cheeky plug for for po podcast guests how about you Angela when you're sort of looking at exhibitions for the museums is that something where you have an idea already in mind that you seek that information out for the exhibition or do you just kind of see what's what's there and what's kind of feeling current and relevant? Um, I think I just find everything interesting and I'm so lucky because obviously we have Bankfield and Smith Art Gallery as well that we look after. So we've got these venues for art exhibitions, for collections exhibitions, and obviously we've got Shibden as well, which doesn't really lend itself as well to exhibitions. But yeah, I think just so many little things, especially when something's kind of relatable to you or just like goats, just kind of like, what? let's just pursue this. <laughs> But yeah, it's an eclectic job. And I think, you know, I'm just thinking as our people were talking then, like next year, I'm going to be doing a toys exhibition um, and this exhibition. <laughs> We've got, um, you know, there's all kinds of stuff sort of back and forth. We've got, it's the year of culture for Calderdale. It's 50 years since the borough was formed. So we're doing a whole swathe of history about the region ready for next year as well. So all kinds of stuff, so like cat's eyes, um, you know, Quality Street, all the kind of Halifax things. And yeah, you do end up just going down a whole rabbit hole of information. And then you have to pull it right back and say, OK, we've got 50 words to explain this. <laughs> um, so, yeah, but that's where you can yeah lose your time quite quickly. But I think yeah, my fault is I just find everything interesting and I like to do exhibitions about everything. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. That sounds fabulous. All of those exhibitions coming up, um, lots and lots of rabbit holes um, to go down. Um, which I'm sure many people in our audience can 100% relate to when they're thinking about uh, the work that they've done on, on some of the journals um, of, of Amnesty too. Um, fabulous. Well, I'm, I'm interested to know what are the stories that members of the public particularly ask you about? Is it Anlister? Is is it generally speaking most of your um kind of most of your um customers um are interested in in Anne and that's what's prompted them to visit or or do you have other things that you you're putting on um exhibitions creating content for um that that is broader than Anlister? Um, I think Sarah, like you've touched on the Black abolitionists and and Angela, you've touched on some of the um kind of other um exhibitions that you you've got coming up. Um, Sarah, could you tell us a little bit more about kind of some of the other topics that you, you cover um, in, in local studies and that you've worked on? Yeah, so I'd say that Anne List is probably the individual that people haven't already got a connection to the library ask us about. But the vast majority of our queries are people that are asking about either places or people that they've got a personal connection to. So it'll be, my family worked for Crossley Carpets, what can you tell me about them? Or they'll be like, from America or Canada, and they found out that they've got a relative that comes from Halifax and they'll want to know a bit about the area. And also the one that we always get is, uh, I want to know about my house. 
it's first thing you do if you move into a new house you're like I want to know who lived there when it was built what the area was like um so yeah that's probably the most common one we get yeah well, I, have, I have very interesting house history um and and lots of interest in in how the the resources that you've got connect with people's own lives mm -hmm. um not just um lives from kind of past um families of Halifax um too that's that's really interesting um how about you Angela how, what what are people coming to visit the museums for um all kinds of stuff really I think in Bankfield it's a lot of uh, local history people that live in Ackroydon which is the model village that Edward Ackroyd who built Bankfield um sort of managed he built that and it's kind of like um salt air but better I always say because he built it with the people in mind the houses were mortgaged to the people so they would own them themselves and um, they weren't rented or just whilst you worked there he was investing in people's lives and their futures um and yeah so I think Ackroydon is fascinating we do get a lot of local interest there um and then people sort of come into the house in the you know really random place of just on, on the edge of Halifax and people are just bowled over with how massive and ornate and wonderful this house is um but yeah I think the first thing that popped to my head as soon as you said that was at Shibden it's always the tower and the tunnels <laughs> like <laughs> I think everything else is um kind of yeah quite explored and seen a lot but yeah nearly everybody wants to know about the tower and the tunnels um yes. I think they're kind of the more sort of secret aspects to Amnister and I suppose the tower because of the inaccessibility of it is kind of I think people think that we keep it under lock and key but it's just that we can't get people up to it in the same way and yeah the tunnels I think it's often seen as quite a um a, a obviously kind of hidden and it's people read it as perhaps she was trying to keep the servants out of mind but again everybody did it's kind of a standard thing in a lot of houses to have tunnels and access routes and all this um but yeah and they're they're interesting, but yeah, they're not that exciting. <laughs> Shipton's not that big, so none of them are particularly long. Um, but yeah, we um, it's towers and tunnels. That's what everybody always wants to see. But I did do some videos to share them, yes. but um, I'll probably need to do that again. Get some fresh tower and tunnel videos out there. <laughs> yeah, the bits that are still a little bit mysterious, perhaps. Yeah. We we know so much from the journals now that I guess it's it's those bits that you still kind of want to get that sense of of Anne being there perhaps for for those visitors um how about you Reese? what are people coming to the archives for oh, pretty much anything and everything um like um sort of Sarah was saying we do get a lot of people who are looking into the history of their houses or their own personal sort of family history um we'll get lots of people coming in for Anne and all of the people in Anne's life um and then we'll get people who might be looking um, as part of sort of, you know, academia. They might be looking at a particular sort of quite wide ranging um, topic, such as like migration in Yorkshire. And they find one little thing in our collection and they and they come in. Um, so it can be really anything and everything. Um, a lot of our collections will get used for um sort of purposes of uh, providing evidence and proving things somebody might want to come in and uh, look at some building plans because they need to change a bit of the house and they don't have original plans so there's sort of anything you can imagine that you might go oh if there's a document that says this it'd be really useful to have people come along to archives to kind of find those things yeah yeah seeking evidence or or receipts as we'd call them um, oh, yeah. Lots to, of receipts in our to back up their kind of expectations, perhaps around kind of things like you know what were the goats called? Where were their registration cards? Like that's where you, that, you're going to find it in the archives. Um, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Um, Jill, I, I'm going to ask you a slightly different question because I'm really interested as as somebody who has kind of curated so many wonderful podcast episodes. Like, how do you choose? the content how do you cut that down into an episode when when doing that, that research and, and conducting the interviews um how, how do you choose how do you select and edit um down to just leave in in some things and unfortunately perhaps having to leave out others yeah it I mean we we always record far more than we can use so you you end up with all this material and um we've been really lucky that we've had some great guests, um, all really knowledgeable, 
engaging and and they've all been lovely um but it during the course of the recording sometimes there's just too much material for the podcast i like to try and keep them to about 45 minutes um 40 45 50 minutes and sometimes it, we do go off on a bit of a tangent as well which, which is fine in conversation but it's not great for a podcast really so once you've got all the recording um well before then actually it's kind of my job to kind of keep keep it at the narrative so that you've got beginning and a middle and an end and so I try to do that by guiding the guest who has so much knowledge um, with questions so that so that you know it helps him focus and then afterwards it's a case of editing and Sometimes a little tangent, going off in a little tangent's nice because it's either funny or it, it just feels really natural. And sometimes you just feel like you're veering off too far. And um, unfortunately, things like that do get edited out. Um, yeah, but it, it's I really enjoy that part of it, the editing. And well, I enjoy all of it, but it it is it is about sort of creating this story um, so that you don't, I feel like I'm rambling now. <laughs> so, that, so, so that you know, you keep the interest of the audience basically. They Excellent. Have faith, they have faith in you, you and the guest, the story. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. Um, no, that's really fantastic insight into that process and and how you kind of take all of that down into that kind of, as you say, forty five minute um ish um episode of the podcast. Awesome. So we've heard a little bit about kind of what you do on an individual basis. I'm wondering about some of those collaborative projects because you you work for organisations across Halifax that are very separate. They're their own organisations in their own right. But how do you come together to collaborate um, on projects? And I'm I'm thinking maybe Ruth will start with you as the custodians of the journals um, and other materials from the Shipton Hall collection, kind of what have you collaborated on um with um with your colleagues um there's plenty of uh, sort of opportunities for us all to collaborate on on and related things and on non and related things um sometime you know i know we're all in communication with each other and talk to talk to each other quite a lot um so there's various different things for um part of sort of the Anlister birthday festival we'll get together we'll talk we'll we'll plan events or um I think last year um Sarah had put together this really great family trail um across Halifax that I'd sort of uh, worked with her on which was amazing um I know me and Sarah have worked on some joint events in the past um because the nature of our collections local studies archives and museums is because we've geographically connected by Calderdale it's people anything that happened in Calderdale we're basically all interested in it there are so many different crossovers that to be honest you could pick anything and all three of us as organizations will probably go yeah we've got some on that like let's have a chat um it, it sort of happens quite a lot and I certainly know there's lots of plans um going forward of things future things that we're currently planning now which will come to fruition soon um so it's there's so much that we can work on together and that we do and it's just one of those things that sometimes we just wish we had more time to just get together and chat and plan and do all these amazing things yeah no fantastic um Angela the thing that I I kind of first comes to mind for me is the Shiddon 600 exhibition um was that something that that was kind of collaborative and and kind of you all came together on um to, to pull that together as one continuous story of Shipton Hall yeah I think it was unfortunately it was kind of just a bit Covid times because <laughs> it was supposed to be 2021 um so 2021 was when we were going to be sort of collecting more and doing more but obviously we ended up doing a lot more online but yeah I remember going I saw Sarah at the library and looked at what they'd got to do with Shipton and uh, again we're looking at what we can share and what we can do together um, but yeah, just saying about that, I think, you know, the digitisation of the diaries was a huge collaboration within museums and archives. Um, we kind of were like, let's do it. And obviously we had to sort the logistics and get that done. That was a big collaboration that was very productive. Um, and then obviously conservation of the diaries, that was various conversations and putting people in touch with the right person to get that to happen. 
uh, I've done one of Sarah and Jill's co- uh, podcasts. So yeah, we do have some things, and I think I, Ruth, I should have chatted to you before, but we are going ahead, aren't we? <laughs> I don't know whether we should say it at the moment, or shall I save it for later? About the exhibition? Are we? <laughs> I think we have a bit of a history at uh, Summit Weekend of. <laughs> of kind of having announcements and spoiler alerts and things like that. So if you are in a position to share, I'm sure that everybody will really, um, really love that. But we also respect that perhaps that's where we, we can we can move on to another question if you'd rather. I think we should have emailed you on Friday, Ruth. Oh, we, are you OK? Give me a thumbs up if we're OK. Yeah, cool. So we are collaborating and doing an exhibition for March and April uh, next year. So, yeah, not long now. Um, and that will be looking at Amnister Archives and hosting at Bankfield. Um, so it will be the, um, in her own words, exhibition expanded upon um, and at Bankfield for yeah March, as soon as the Shipton opens and over the Amnister birthday as well. Um, so, yeah, sorry, I'm just throwing us in at the deep end. <laughs> but no. I don't know if anything, because other than that it's happening, we haven't ironed out anything else yet. But it's it's nice to be able to say, and again, that's, you know, kind of, yeah, us all coming together and saying, what can we do um, and share um, as much access to the collections as possible? That's what we're all about. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Well, you heard it here first, everybody. Um, <laughs> that sounds absolutely, we'll, we'll keep an eye out and we'll make sure that um, for those of you who are watching, um, we'll we'll share um, any information as it becomes available about that exhibition. Um, I know that lots of people perhaps wanted to get to the In Her Own Words exhibition at Wakefield and, and weren't able to. So I'm sure they'll be um, waiting um, in anticipation to, to be able to, to see that more. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, and I'm going to very swiftly move on before we get too excited and, and start to kind of press you about any uh, of, of that detail. And I'm going to go back um, to you, Sarah, and to you, Jill, about kind of what the library. And I know that that you've both been involved, particularly in 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 the podcast. Um, and I'm wondering about how, like, how did that come about? How how did we end up with with a podcast about local history? Um, well, uh, it was it was born out of COVID lockdowns, basically. Um, all the libraries were closed, and um, as a team in local studies, we had to think on our feet as to, well, if the libraries are closed, how how can we take the libraries to, to people? So people came in the team, came up with um, lots of different ideas, um, inventive ideas, but the podcast was really just one avenue to explore. And I got sent on a digital boot camp and um, at that boot camp, um, Essex Library Service had already a podcast up and running called The Only Way is Reading. And um, I th- I thought, well, you know, we could do that. We could do it as local history. So um, I mentioned it to the team and Sarah was really up for it. Sarah has backgrounds in media and, and sound engineering. And um, yeah, so it was great. We just kind of like took it from there, didn't we? Um, yeah. Fabulous. I don't know what's, whether Sarah wants to say anything <laughs> as well. No, I mean, I suppose we'd started doing videos as well, and but then we were like, yeah. maybe we were running out of visual content that we had access to in the library. So a podcast was sort of a good way to, to get a story across. Yeah. It's just quite a nice medium as well to, to yeah. listen to. Yeah. So it yeah. sounds like the the pandemic was perhaps a bit of a catalyst for exploring more digital options around how we get material yeah. out to a wider audience, really, a more global audience, just at the same time as kind of um, Amnesty was becoming more globally renowned. Um, and, and the pandemic has really helped that along and, and kind of not just in the podcast, but in other digital um, means of access too. That's fabulous. So when you're thinking about um, kind of some of the topics that you've already covered on the podcast, is there anything that... Um, you perhaps wish you were able to tell or or maybe if we're if, if you're up for a, a bit of a spoiler alert a bit of announcement we, we, we've got a, one already but if you've got an upcoming episode that you'd really like to, to kind of share so for people to keep an eye out um for um what, what topic would that be oh gosh we both there's a few <laughs> um this, i've recorded i've got about three that are sort of sitting there waiting to be edited at the moment um 
Yeah, we've we've done so many, haven't we, Sarah? I think I think we've done. I think we've covered about something like twenty six subjects. Some of them have been more than one episode. Um. So yeah, we've done quite a lot. Um. Coming up, um, we've got a Charles Dickens one at Christmas because um he came to Halifax at one point mm -hmm. um to talk. Um, he actually read his book at Christmas carols, slightly abridged version. And it took about two hours and people just came and sat and listened. Um, so there was there's that. Um, and the guest, my guest is David Glover for that one. And Excellent. um yeah, and then there's there's a few others, and I'm sort of at the moment researching Halifax race course. Um, I didn't know there was ever a race course in Halifax. Um, it was just discovered by accident. I guess um sorry, not a guess. Um, somebody came in the library and they wanted to look at the maps to find the race course. And I was thinking, race course, you know. <laughs> but yes, there was a race course. So that's kind of like one I'm planning. Yeah. Such a broad, diverse range of topics. I'm definitely going to be listening out for that um Charles Dickens episode. David's a friend of the summit. Um, so yeah. that I'm sure that's gonna be absolutely fabulous. And I think if you're if you haven't um found where you can um, access the podcast. Um, some of the Summit Squad are popping some links in the chat for you. Um, if, if anybody watching wants to um, find out where they can listen to that. And we've even got um, some of the um, people who are watching along um, sharing some of their favourite episodes um, of the podcast in the chat too, which is lovely. Um, so we've got lots of love for um, the, the one about Corpse Ways um, and Robin Hood um, oh, and um, apparently Dickens was a friend of Steph Belcom and his family in York. So we've got some connections there to the wider um, and Lister um, universe. Um, so that's um, super. Can I just so, say our number course. one, our number one most popular episode is um, the one we recorded with Angela. <laughs> She's top of the pops. <laughs> Excellent. The Richard episodes are the most popular ones. Yeah. And another example of that collaboration between the different yeah. um, organisations. There we go. Excellent. Yeah. So I'm going to shift ever so slightly. I'm very conscious that we could talk for so long about all of these different topics. I want to talk um, to you, Angela, about the museums and the enormous privilege, I guess, of kind of being able to create exhibitions in spaces like Shipton. Um, hall and at Bankfield where that history actually took place so the architecture the buildings themselves are part of um, the exhibition and I'm wondering about kind of like how do you work with that space um, when you're creating that that exhibition um, and sort of bringing it in as part of, of that journey for the visitor Okay, yeah, I mean, working in historic sites is just, yeah, a real privilege. It's it's really nice to be in those places, and especially with obviously Shipton Hall being at Lister's home. I mean, you can't do better than walking in her footsteps regularly. <laughs> and um, But obviously there's then a lot of pressure to know everything. And obviously people assume <laughs> I've got the time, which I don't have to have read everything and have read all the diaries. I, I wish she was my full-time job sometimes, but she is quite a small part of it in a way. Um, but yeah, but being in the buildings is amazing. The buildings speak so much. And I think Shibden, as Anlister's home, there's, you know, you can't, you, everywhere you walk or look, there's Anne Lister pretty much splattered all over the place. You know, it was so much of it was her and her hand and you can see her decisions and what she's chosen to do and what she's presented the hall to be through her time there. Um, and I think that's so amazing for, you know, for women's history and particularly lesbian history to have somebody really imprinted on their building. Often you have like the birthplace of somebody and obviously, you know, they've long since gone. The furniture's gone. It's been ripped apart. You know, there's no fireplaces left. There's no doors left. It's such a different building. A lot of National Trust properties and other homes of writers, for example, you know, they're so they have to work really hard to recreate them. Whereas what we have at Shivden is pretty much kind of a time capsule. You know, the family had it and it became straight into a museum as is. So we're really lucky in that way that it does seem very close to what it would have been like when Anne was there. But obviously, even in her time, you know, we change our furniture and our layouts and our curtains 
regularly. So we're trying to capture, you know, we don't know exactly as it would have looked in, say, 1838. We can make guesses. But I think the main thing that should do is you do get that feel of that period and that presence of Anne in what we have there. So, yeah, we're really lucky. Flip side is Shibden's really hard to do any exhibitions in. Um, there's so little space. Um, we do struggle. We have done a few costume exhibitions. We've done a literary exhibition there before, just putting things into the room settings. And obviously, as soon as it was Gentleman Jack, um, it, obviously it was the film set at one point, and then we obviously were nodding back to film and it as a film set. Um, and now we're back to it being Anne Lister's home. Um, but yeah, you're with you know we're guessing at some things. And like her bedroom, it's it's a guess really. We've based the bedroom on what the TV series made it look like, which we don't think is particularly accurate. <laughs> Looking at her references, so yeah, it's all it's all kind of fiction, but trying to do it as best as we can. Um, your question was more about exhibitions, and yeah, we'd love to do more exhibitions at Shibden, but there just isn't the space. There's the one room. <clears throat> where we've got uh, information panels and cases. But as you can see from what's in there, that's it. That's basically everything else that we have to do with Shivden in that room and a potted history of its history and what's gone on there and Anne's life. Um, so yeah, it's hard to do. You have to reduce it all down into a very little bit of information and you can only display what you have. And like with Anne, there's, you know, at most people you know there's about a dozen objects that are directly related to her. But the house itself is really related to her. And I think we're lucky that we've got that imprint, you know, her initials on the staircase and stuff. You can't beat that, really. No. Um, so, yeah, it's a tricky one because, yeah, we'd like to, exhibitions are hard, which is why um, the archives exhibition will be at Bankfield just down the road. And same with the Gentleman Jack costumes. It was so much easier to put them in a different venue, but within a mile. Um, so you can see them in their glory, trying to fit them in at Shivden, trying to shoehorn them in corners of rooms. It just didn't really work. Um, so, yeah, oh, I could talk all day, but I think that, did that answer it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's something that you said there that really kind of resonated with me. And for those, I'm sure for those who also have been incredibly lucky enough to go to Shivden Hall, that first time when you step into the house chamber and, and sensing that presence, of Anne and she's there overlooking you yeah, um, yeah. with her portrait there is nothing that beats that um so as like as we said like the house itself um is in itself an exhibition even if you haven't got kind of perhaps uh, the variety of the items and things that you'd be able to display at, at, at Bankfield um so for those of you who haven't perhaps have been to Shibden Hall but not gone along to Bankfield we would definitely recommend um that you do that that is also a fabulous building with lots more to see um, so definitely get yourself there um, next time you're in Halifax. I think we'll go to, um, we'll, we'll give you a, a little bit of a breather, Angela, and we'll, we'll go to Ruth and the archives. And um, Ruth, the archives preserve many stories. And um, so when you're um, kind of selecting a limited number of those stories um, to say prepare for a particular exhibition, um, are, how selective are you in terms of sort of do you pick them based on t telling a particular story do you kind of think oh these are the most interesting or do you do a bit of both like what's the process there in selecting which bits you might kind of display um for for, visit, for visitors to see um it's sort of a little mix of of both uh we'll tend to have a have a look and a think and go we might want to tell a particular story about a person or we might want to um, have a particular collection in mind and be like, we want an exhibition about this collection. Or we might think less about the content of the records and more of the records themselves. So we could do, you know, an exhibition on a particular type of record that we have lots of different examples of um, and actually talk about, like, the material the records are made of and how they were created. I know um, currently in our Wakefield office there's a medieval magnified exhibition on and a lot of that will talk about you know these medieval records and what they're made of and how they were created they won't necessarily dive too much into the content of them because a lot of them are in Latin I think all of them might be in Latin um, so it's it kind of depends what we're deciding we want to talk about do we want to talk about the archives as objects themselves do we want to talk about the person that created them 
or have we given ourselves a theme? And I think because the collections are so varied with so many different angles, it's really just a really nice pleasure to be able to go, well, I could do 75 different things. I'll just pick one and the rest can go on a list that I'll get to eventually. Um, so yeah, it's a, it just kind of depends what we fancy, I guess. No, super duper. No, that's, it, it, I guess it's a very fortunate position to be in to, to have so much choice. And I find, I think it's really interesting that it's not always the content that you're thinking about. It's actually just showcasing types of documents. I think that's a really interesting angle that perhaps not everybody appreciates that that's, um, that, that, that is a, a reasonable option um, to, to go along um, and, and curate an exhibition um, on. I'm just wondering, as a bit of a follow-up to that question, Ruth, um, are there any lesser known items from the collection? Um, I guess most of the audience today are going to be more familiar perhaps with the Shifton Hall collection, but is there anything lesser known that you think, apart from registering goats, tell a great story? Um, so, so many of them. I think the one that sort of relatively recently I was um, looking at was a sort of little joint um event that Sarah and myself did for the Libraries of um, Sanctuary Award that the the library got um, that sort of tied in with sort of Refugee Week and um, it was about the Belgian refugees coming over to Halifax uh, sort of during the First World War and there was this um, Dutch composer that was living um, in Halifax who was very instrumental in working with these Belgian refugees and then he went on to compose a piece of music called the Belgian refugees which we um, have sort of the um, sheet music for um, in a collection of his so it's just we had a sort of a loose theme for that um, that we were looking for stories of you know people coming into Halifax um, and kind of stumbled upon that and was like this is great this is this is such a wonderful little story it'd be great to be able to tell this and show this to people so it's um, yeah, there's a there's an awful lot of them. Yeah, that that sounds fabulous. I think there's definitely some interest. Um, Yannicka, um, who is also one of our summit facilitators, I I, I I knew straight away that that she'd be in the chat. So I think we need to definitely connect you uh, to find out about that um, that that Dutch composer. Um, awesome. So just one final question before we go to Q and A. Um, I'm just wondering, um, kind of specifically maybe you Ruth and, and perhaps you Angela but also Sarah and Jill if you've got um something that you'd like to contribute um I know there's often lots of interest in whether um, documents and items that are displayed are the real deal and I'm just wondering kind of do you use copies do you use kind of um kind of copies of documents perhaps or do you use replica items um and if so um in what circumstances would you do that instead of using an original? And I'm happy for anybody to just, just chime in with uh, any examples that they have. I don't, I don't mind chiming in. Um, for the most part, if we can, if the document is, um, you know, of a condition to be displayed, we want to display the original. We want people to be able to see the originals. People tend to have that emotional connection more when, when the actual item is in front of them, and they can, I don't know, you kind of connect with the the person that created it more if it's if it's the um the, the real deal um but every now and then um you'll get um uh, an item in archives that is massive like a map or a giant plan and you don't have a case that's big enough for it and at that point you might go we might need to make a copy shrink it down um so that we can still show people these amazing things but we tend to be restricted by the space we've got um a lot of the time so that will be when we might use copies or if the original um isn't in a, a condition um to be displayed yeah that makes so much sense in terms of i guess a lot of the items that you have their condition may not be um kind of what it used to be um so it makes sense not to kind of risk that uh, any further um and i'm sure that that um yeah, size perhaps is an issue too, I guess. Um, is there is there something in particular that you have to, in mind in terms of some of it? Like, how big are we talking um, in terms of some of those plans? Um, we've got many, many plans um, that, you know, me and Steve and, and, and Jenny, who are 
work with me in the archives. Um, it takes two of us to carry the plan out to the search room. Um, there's absolutely no way they would ever fit in a case. And even then, we've only got a table so big. So when someone wants to look at it, we have to roll half of it out so they can see it and then roll it up so they can see the other half because the table isn't big enough. Um, so anyone who's been in our search room and seen our big middle table, we have things much bigger than the big middle table. So they would never fit in a display case. How about you, Angela? Is there anything that comes to mind in terms of kind of original items versus replicas? Yeah, I think, again, for exhibitions, everything at Banquet, it's all real. <laughs> um, the only thing I was thinking of, what's funny is at Shibden, the only thing that is a replica, <laughs> which has only just recently gone, it, is the Amnister bed. Um, everything else in the house, the furniture is all real it's funny it's a funny word you could write a whole thesis about what real even means um but yeah all of it is old <laughs> original but yeah the amnister bed is the only thing that's a reproduction made to look like a bed from the 1800s um which again we deliberated we were looking for an original but um it needed to be um yeah well a they're really impossible to come across um, and it needed to be strong enough to be moved and shipped and put up in Shippen Hall. And we really liked the idea of people sitting on the bed. There was something about a reproduction um, that meant, you know, you could <laughs> lie in Alistair's bed, even though it's not Alistair's bed. But it was just that we knew that the bedroom was going to be an important space for people. And I think we went, you could either go, you know, even if you bought an original bed that was 200 odd years old, it's still not Alistair's bed. So you might as well get a reproduction bed that you can actually sit on and take a photo. So yeah, there's complexities about reproduction and real. And obviously there's the whole level of real for the TV series because none of their stuff belonged to Shivden or Alistair, but it was all historic furniture. So it was as old as what they were filming, but it wasn't provenance to Shipton Hall, but obviously we didn't want them to use our furniture because they were putting things on it, sitting on stuff, throwing things across the room. So it, yeah, there's lots of interesting stuff. And then obviously because of the pandemic, season two, a lot of it, much more was filmed in a studio and they 3D printed a lot of the furniture from Shipton. And watching it, I can see, like I'm like, yep, yeah, fake. Fake, fake, fake. <laughs> but without, you know, but you wouldn't necessarily, you're busy watching the actors. You're not, shouldn't be looking at the furniture unless you're me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they did it so well. It was really impressive. But also, that, again, theoretically, that's really interesting that they're recreating this world. And although the world at Shipton Hall still exists, they were recreating that furniture using 3D printing because of COVID. And yeah, anyway, so that's just food for thought. <laughs> but as far as display goes and objects goes yeah we're lucky we don't have anything too massive but like everything that we have we just display the originals of what we're talking about yeah but i know with archives obviously you can have some really fragile things um and with ours the most sensitive stuff is obviously um paintings watercolors and sketches and also um with fabric and textiles but you make that choice if we're going to display it we display it sort of short term and low light levels or you just decide not to display it and yeah. keep it safe. Makes sense, definitely. Thank you so much, Angela. Um, I think it's about time we go on to some questions from the audience. We've had quite a few come in. Um, so firstly, I'm going to, so to anybody, uh, because we attract quite a global audience to the summit. Um, and there's lots of interest in how non-local audiences who perhaps don't can't access kind of Halifax um, as easily as others, how can they support your um, incredible work online? So like what what metrics help your work to succeed? Kind of are we should we be kind of re be really interactive with social media or, or have you got a donation page where where we can, um people who would like to can, can kind of contribute um to, to work in other ways um i'm sure um all of you have different um ways that audiences can do that um from afar I, answer? Yeah. I think i think just engaging with anything that we put online is good like because we do track um, the number of people that listen to the podcast, the number of people that visit our blog pages. I know West Yorkshire Archives track like people that visit their web page and the catalogue and things like that. 
so as well as like liking us on you know instagram or whatever also yeah just visiting and listening to our stuff but also um emailing us if you've got questions as well so we're directly engaging with people because we're always up for that and um yeah it's the sort of thing that we do sort of record or we can feedback as well excellent fabulous so anybody else have anything they want to jill i think you wanted to yeah just i mean yeah follow us on social media channels comment on episodes and um yeah, and as Sarah says, contact us directly at the library. Yeah. Yeah. It's always, it's great getting feedback from people and also having chats about things because quite often people come back to you and they've got more information. You know, they, they, they're they giving you feedback and, and you're getting even more information from them. So it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's probably the same for museums. It's, yeah, look at the website. Um, let me know if there's any mistakes. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a 3D tour on the website of social media. There's all the films of that recent Helen the Whitbread film. Watch it, share it. It's free. We did it because we wanted to share her story. Um, there's a We have an e-news for museum service, and that tells you about events, but also kind of other stuff that we're doing. Um, we've got an online shop, and there are donation buttons on there if you'd like to, and all of any donations go directly for the collections themselves. Um, we've just had a painting uh, cleaned, uh, rehung. It had come off its frame and we've got it glazed. So it's now on display in the main hall at Bankfield. But that cost four and a half thousand pounds <laughs> for one painting. And obviously, we look after, we've got um, several hundred oil paintings and we've got thousands of watercolours, prints, uh, photographs. You know, so again, I'm sure it's the same as the archives. You know, one particular, you know, there's things that are pri- become a priority, like Amnesty's diaries. Um, but they cost, I think that was about 5,000 to stabilise and package up the diet, you know, to keep them safe. And the digitisation was about £5,000 originally as well. Um, but the more money we get, the more of these kind of projects we can do. Obviously, uh, the letters are going to involve a lot more conservation and work to get to the point where they can be digitised. But these are projects that we can, we can do if people are keen and um, are willing to support as well. Um, so, yeah. Um, but yeah, just I think it's just knowing that when you're doing, you put a lot of work in to share something online <laughs> and you hope that people like it and look at it. Um, and like the Helena films, you know, again, I've seen there are people watching it, but yeah, any feedback and, you know, just share it and find places where we can screen them, get them on telly. It would be amazing if that they, you know, the, the Amnesty film and the Helena Whitbread film could actually be on telly. So if anybody has any contacts in any country, um, just yeah, let's we do these things because we want people to see them. Like the 3D tour, you know, it's not profit. We just did it because we were locked down. So yeah, please share and explore and mm-hmm. um, and suggestions. Yeah, please. Yeah, well, I'm hearing that you, you kind of don't be shy. Like, <laughs> get in touch, make suggestions, uh, give some feedback, and 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 utilize sort of some of those contacts if you have them. And actually, Angela, you mentioning about um, paintings. Um, leads me on to one of the another question that that from an audience member um, and that is whether there are any portraits in the museum collection connected to Anne Lister that are not currently on display um, there's a couple of mentions of Maria Barlow, Vera Hobart do we know if there are any in the collection is it possible that they're there but we don't yet realise it uh, I'm afraid not. Trust me, I've looked. <laughs> I've searched every single name linked to Amnesty, but yeah, they, we just don't have anything that's known. And again, even the the painting pictures of Amnesty, you know, we kind of the sketches we're quite confident about are the ones that where we've uh, museums have got a copy and West Yorkshire Archives have got two copies of the same one. We're pretty confident that those are the ones that she mentions. But there's still the miniature portrait that's attributed as being Amnesty that we don't know. Um, but no, in the collection, our, our art collection is pretty well catalogued and recorded. We have a lot of unknown people, but how on earth do you ever say that that's somebody in particular? Um, again, what we need really is anybody that's read the diaries and transcribed sections that refer to any of the other paintings. Um, I, there's an online exhibition of the Shibden oils that are on permanent display. Um, and for that, that was looking at Anne's references to getting some of them reframed and um, and cleaned and conserved back in her day. So we've kind of put the pieces together. We think we know 
who everybody is. Um, but yeah, I'd love to just come across one that's got Mariana written across the back or something. That would be really nice. <laughs> be nice. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, if I do find anything, I will share it. Um, but at the moment, I've not come across anybody else within Anne's circle, I'm afraid. All right, thank you. Um, and I guess perhaps for you again, Angela, or, or anybody, um, really, in terms of the, the collections that you hold, um, whether that's kind of museums, physical objects, um, archives and, and the collections there. Is there any ambition to bring um, any portion of, of those collections um, for exhibition abroad or in other parts of the country? Um, um, I don't... Yeah, you think. I was going to say, uh, no, uh, we don't have any sort of um, plans or anything um, to show um the anything from the um Shipping Hall collection that we've got at um at the archives um sort of wider than uh the West Yorkshire region. I think digitization is the key. I mean obviously having that's summit that I'm sure we're all thinking of for the future is what's next. Um what you know that's the only way really to share safely. And I think with collections I mean, if somebody would pay us enough money, I'm happy to fly somewhere <laughs> with a few things. But you're yeah. talking a lot of money. And it's funny with the Anne Lister portrait, before Sally told us she was going to do a series about Anne Lister, um, the Anne Lister portrait was over in Munich <laughs> on display. Um, and again, she's she's been shipped to a few different countries before. Um, but obviously, as soon as Gentleman Jack happened, it then becomes priceless. So you couldn't really risk the portrait, for example, going anywhere. And the same with the diaries. I mean, Ruth, I'm having to get her in a headlock to even give me a few for display. <laughs> it's just, and again, our job is it, our job is hard. Our job is to preserve, but also to share. And you really do have to decide what's kind of worth doing. It is you know, we still would hope that people can find the way to come to us to see the stuff in Halifax. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's other options that we get, there's reproductions, <laughs> there's copy, there's digitization, there's, you know, us making new films. We could do 3D scanning of some of the objects as well and get those out there more. So yeah, there's there's ways of doing it, but I don't think we'll be getting on a plane with diaries and her writing desk or anything anytime soon, I'm afraid. Just can't. Have. If you'd have asked us like five years ago, we'd have probably gone, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think now they're so tied to Halifax. Um, I think people wouldn't want us to take them anywhere yeah. else, I'm afraid. Yeah. Sorry, come and see sure. <laughs> ah, Definitely. Um, thank you, Angela. Um, so uh, we've got five minutes left and I've got a couple of questions that um, I'm really going to try hard to, for us to get to. Um, so... One of them, I think, is probably for you, Ruth, although feel free to chime in um, any of the uh, panel members. And that's uh, around kind of more contemporary um, lesbians um, or, or other uh, members, perhaps, of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, maybe those particularly um, in this question interested in uh, people who came of age in the, in the 60s. Um, so a little bit more recent than perhaps um, Anne's time. Um, are they contributing their letters and stories and photos um, that capture their own experiences? Um, and if people have that kind of material and they're interested in kind of having that deposited in an archive um, or, or otherwise, um, how can they do that? It's sort of really important that people do think about them themselves and, and their records that they have now, contemporary records, um, and potentially down the line think, oh, I could give these to my local archives or a specialist collection um, so that those stories are out there because we always want to make our collections as diverse as the world is. Um, and we can only do that if we have um, have the stuff in our collections, essentially. Um, you know, it's not a surprise to say that history tends to be the straight white male, at least you know, in this country. Um, and we'd love to have stories that represent everyone. And the only way we can do that is if people offer us their collections. So yeah, if you have a contemporary collection, um, think about your local archive service, approach them, have those chats with them. Because um, it's really important because 
that's how we tell everyone's story um, through our collections. Obviously, the more modern it is, there may be issues of things like data protection that you kind of have to think about. But we certainly at the you know West Yorkshire Archive Service, we'll have more contemporary um, kind of collections. We have a West Yorkshire Queer Stories, um, which is a fab- fabulous resource of um, you know oral histories and things like that, which are much more recent than you know say Anne Lister. Um, so yeah, we're always wanting to do that. So yeah, if you have a collection, think about your local archive service or local studies or museum, depending on what it is. Yeah, yes, wherever you are, doesn't have to be Halifax, wherever you are. Thank you, Ruth. Just a couple of quick questions before we bring the session to a close. Um, one, there's um, somebody in the audience who is interested to know whether the film about the Wakefield diarist, Clara Clarkson is going to be produced. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Um, I'm not sure about the film. I do know um, that there was a website and a project called Forgotten Women of Wakefield. And I believe she has a page on their website. If you want more information about her, it might be a good place um, to to check out. But I'm not sure about a a film related to that. And Angela, I think you mentioned earlier on uh, an exhibition around toys. And there's been a, a, somebody's very curious to know whether the creepy dolls are going to make a comeback at Shibden. <laughs> For those who have been yes. to Shibden, definitely, know not, what, what definitely not at Shibden. I think they were gone before I started. Um, but yeah, no, I, 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 it's, a, it's a very happy toy exhibition. <laughs> There'll be nothing creepy. I don't do creepy. I've just had to do a spooky pumpkin trail and I'm really squeamish and ter- I don't do horror or anything. So it's very family friendly, and the same with toys. Yeah, I'm a I'm a teddy bear person, but yeah, they'll all have at least two eyes and look cuddly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm hoping that's yeah. I'm hoping for, the, for that person, that's good news. Or perhaps they might be a little bit disappointed that the creepy dolls aren't making a comeback. Um, but no, we are just thinking about coming um, to time now. This has been an absolutely fantastic panel thank you so much to all four of you for taking the time to kind of share how you bring these stories to life in in your day jobs in your in your working lives and probably beyond and um, it's been really really insightful um the summit team have been um incredible at dropping lots of different um links into the chat um for, for those in the audience who want to follow up on anything and as you've already heard get in touch with the team and um and give them feedback engage with the materials and let them know um how how brilliantly they're doing and what you want to see um thank you so much to everybody who has joined us um and um coming up very soon we have um, our session with Emma Donoghue about the new Eliza Rain uh, novel Learned by Heart. So um, if you're sticking around for that, we'll see you there very shortly. Thank you again, panel, and thank you to everybody who's joined us. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs>